All right, it's the holiday season. It's December 2011, and Sydney and Stephanie and Mr. Bennett, and we're talking with Mary Van Meter, and it's like gorgeous holiday decorations we'll see in a little while. And Mary is a member of the, say the correct thing, the Edmonds? Edmonds South Snohomish County Historical Society. Which is a long name, and there's a lot. We're going to come. Way too long. It's a lot of stuff. <laughs> but Mary, I, first thing I want to ask you is: everyone, all people, have a story of how they got the name that they got. What's your story? I believe that Mary is named after my grandmother, whose name was Mary Helen. I have absolutely no idea where Diane came from. My full name is Mary Diane Stewart Van Meter, and Stewart was my maiden name. Obviously, I got that because it was my parents' name. Um, what more do you want to know about Perfect. that? Perfect. And um, Van Meter, I got because I married my husband fifty-one years ago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you know anything about like ancestry in the past? I mean, do you have do you have Scottish ancestry, European roots, on your side, and your mom's side, mom or dad's side of the family, or something? Um, I believe that we have Scottish ancestry, but during the Civil War. The Stewart, fam the Stewart part of the family was in Virginia, and um, all of the records were burned. So there are no records beyond the Civil War for the Stewarts that we can legitimately um, connect to, where we've got written proof, uh, whether it's um, from graveyards or, or whatever. However, I have this passionate friend who does who loves to do historical genealogy for the DAR. And this woman has found 37 direct relatives that fought in the Revolutionary War or served in the war in some capacity, whether it's selling beef or whatever, which probably makes me a little militant, I think. I'm not certain. It's kind of scary to think about 37 proven relatives for that. Um, but this is her passion. I don't care about that, but I love the story and history, and so I grab those people and where they are from, and I do things like read the book 1776, and my, my relatives didn't do anything special, but I'll take the village they came from and I'll follow the history through the villages in the, in the stories. Um, so, have you always had like a passion for history since you were a kid, or has it started as you've gotten older? It's developed, of course. <clears throat> My father was a history buff. He, he loved the Civil War stories um, and would take us on these car rides all over the place. We used to go to all the Civil War and American Revolutionary War um, sites of the battles, and I threw up the whole way, so I wasn't real thrilled about this at all. Um, I'd get into the battleground and leave parts of me there, which probably were more pleasant than leaving him in the car. My brother and sister and I fought the whole way, so I can't say as I enjoyed it. But by osmosis, there is no way that anyone in our family could not have grown up with at least paying attention to history wherever we are. I still do that. I, I stop at every historical marker anywhere I am, and I read it. Um, I don't always remember it, and I don't think that's important. I think it's important to just love it, and I do love it. That's awesome. So because of your history, um, I mean, as a hobby and really an interest for all these years, you became involved in the, in the, the local... And it's the Edmonds, excuse me, the South Snohomish County Historical Society? The Edmonds, yeah. Um, so tell me how, how that is related to the museum. I mean, if I'm brand new and I see the museum down in Edmonds, it's a summer day, there's the museum, but it's, it's sort of bigger than that. Tell me, tell us about the big structure. The Edmonds South Snohomish County Historical Society was created in order to collect the history, to collect the paraphernalia, to collect the stories to collect the artifacts, to be able to report the history, to have educational programs for not just Edmonds, but all of South Snohomish County, which is the purpose for the name of it. If we were only the Edmonds Historical Society, then we would be extremely limited. We deliberately included 
the longer name, South Snohomish County, so that we can cover Briar, we can cover Woodway, we can cover Linwood, we can cover Alderwood, we can cover all of these areas because we're so closely related to each other that we do not want to limit ourselves to just the people here in Edmonds. When it was started in 1973, they Edmonds was not very big. Uh, so we needed a little more material. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. so that's that's really what it was all about. We also, since then, Alderwood has its own organization. Um, Woodway has an attempt at it, but not a, not a great deal. Oh dear, that's going to be on tape. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. It's true. Um, I don't want to offend anybody. I, I applaud all the people who are trying to do anything with that um, for all the areas. And we work together with them. We have exchanged uh, exhibits. Now the exhibit part is the part that the museum is part of. Uh, we put on exhibits and do that sort of thing. We have a thing called trunk tales that we take out to the schools. Schools, we have a, a wonderful program that the teachers can use um, and they can rent this program. It's primarily for grade school kids. But we can take this out to them. That's part of the society. That's not part of the museum because it's not on display at the museum. Um, we do research for people. If somebody moves to this town and they want to find out the history of the house they're getting ready to buy, then they contact the historical society. We do the research for them. We get it for them. If they're looking for old pictures, old relatives, old houses, old ghosts we did one we did one on ghosts for some people that was kind of fun wow. um, and so that's all part of the society you're not going to see that in the museum but it's what we do in the back rooms um, we we run the summer market we started that as a fundraiser uh, there were three of us who who started that um, Betty Bell myself and Wanda Peterson and we put um, put that together it was primarily Betty's wonderful idea and we are in our 17th year now, um, in 2011, and um, it has been a tremendous success. We've had other less successful, but still somewhat successful, um, fundraiser events to keep the museum doors open. The museum donations do not cover the expenses of the museum or the society. See, the society is what rents the building. Mm. And the building was the old Carnegie Library that was that was donated a hundred years ago this year in in uh, 1911, um, and so we pay the bills, we pay the utilities, we do that sort of thing, and we take care of the building. The city owns the building; we rent from them. Um, what else can I say about? Wow, that's a lot. I, I I was in the museum not so long ago. What, did you girls go down during the Halloween time mm -hmm. period? Oh yes, that's fun. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things in those storerooms. What are some of the things that are stored? I mean, they just it was just full. Oh, the storerooms are not. There's not much in the way of the storerooms. Yeah. Um, at the museum anymore. Okay. There used to be. We used to have all of our storage there. Now we have two off-site storage units public storage facilities. Uh, mm -hmm. One of them we were renting from the Edmonds School District, which is a huge classroom. We have the things organized. It's all on computer. Uh, if you want to do an apron exhibit, then you get onto the database and you find out that on shelf D of storeroom number one, you can find four aprons there and find out the condition they're in and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Then you go into those. Then you're not opening every precious box and handling everything that is there. We take very, very much, um, well, we, we take very good care of the artifacts that are donated to the museum. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, your hands are horrible on, on artifacts. So we wear gloves, um, we get what we need out of there, we take it out, we put it into the computer that it's part of the exhibit, then we put it back and then we put it back into the computer. Yes, it's back on shelf B of of the storeroom and so forth and so on. So that way when we are doing something or if we're trying to find an artifact for an individual, you know, maybe they donated it to us and they'd say, where's my artifact? And of course it's not their artifact because they deeded it to the to the society. Um, and then we can say, well, we've got it here and come look at it. Or maybe we want to do an exhibit for the library 
or maybe we want to do an exhibit for a sp specific school, or maybe we want to do something for City Hall, then we can do that. We, we get a theme, and then we look it up, and we go do it. And so there's lots to it. There's, there's a, a lot of information that's available to us in that society that is used for many things besides just the museum. The museum is the most obvious frontage that we have with the public, but it is only a it's only the tip of the iceberg as to what what goes on within the society. We've saved the log cabin. Uh, we do not own the log cabin. The log cabin is owned by the city. They were going to tear it down. I think their opinion at the time was to have bathrooms. And somehow we were not real thrilled about that, to have public bathrooms instead of the wonderful log cabin. So the Hanley family uh, originally had donated the cabin to the city and they moved it from its original location. Well, because I live in a log house, I was ex more interested in the log cabin than perhaps some fools, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but we did. We, we spent about three years um, getting the money. We raised over $105,000 to be able to put that thing back together. They had put it on the ground. There was no foundation under it, and it rotted from the bottom up. So we went all over the place to try to find matching logs from the same vintage. Um, I won't get into all of that. Anyway, we, we did a lot of hard work and we got it done. Um, and then, gosh, I spent about 11 months doing the history on it and doing oral histories like you're doing now mm -hmm. of people who knew about the log cabin at the time to get it onto the uh, state historical register. So it is actually an officially um, state historically registered building now and it's going to be a little harder to make bathrooms out of. <laughs> <laughs> Where was it before it was moved? It was up by, um, it was up on, go up 88th, oh, can you turn it off for just a minute? Uh, yeah. What's the school, Jeff, that's it's right up here? Seaview Elementary. Seaview. Mm -hmm. It was right by Seaview Elementary. In fact, it was right about where the library is. Okay. And it was behind the Hanley's house was right next door to that um, elementary school. Mm -hmm. And it was in their backyard. Mm -hmm. And it was built by a man named Mr. Ganahl who worked for American President Lines and he used it for a guest house and some fairly famous movie stars and stuff stayed in the house and other wow. people stayed right. in the house. And then the Hanley's... Um, her brother stayed in the house for a while with a family of four, lived in that little tiny cabin, lived wow. in the back, the tiny little bedroom that's upstairs. They oh had these little windows, and they slept on the on the window seats, the two boys did, wow. and then the, the parents were there. Then after that, then the Hanley's parents lived in it for, I don't know, 20 years, something like that, long time. So it was. it's always been lived in, and it's always been loved, and it still is, and we're really <laughs> glad it's there. Mm -hmm. There's a fire engine that the museum kind of... That's the when society. I heard that, tell us about see, the fire. Are there, is there one or two? There's two. Uh, see, that would be a society event rather than a museum event because it's not going to ever end up in the building and as part of an exhibit to the museum. Mm -hmm. So this is part of what the historical society does to save and preserve. The... Um, I believe, oh gosh, I can't remember the name. I want to say 1938. Is that right? Yeah. Um, fire engine that the city of Edmonds, uh, the people of the city of Edmonds earned enough money and donated enough money to buy this because it had been restored by somebody. It had originally been the fire engine for the city of Edmonds. Um, then it got sold and then a man kept it and he restored it. And um, so nobody wanted it to go away or the enough people didn't want to go away that they, they raised enough money to buy this fire engine and gave it to the city of Edmonds. Well, the city of Edmonds no longer has a fire department because it's part of the county now. We did a levy and, and turned our fire department into a county fire department and there's talk that it may be um, even going bigger than that. And so the fire engine is currently kept in what used to be the Edmonds fire department building, which is right there by uh, the police station. Mm -hmm. If it, if for some reason the city decides it no longer wants it, 
then it will be given to the society, the historical society, uh, at which time we will be responsible for it. We must find a home for it. We will take care of it. Um, there is a foundation that has been set up, and I don't know the name of the organization, but it's a, it's a fire safety support group for what had been there for the fire department. They would buy things for them that weren't in their budget, you know, extra extra bandages, I don't know, whatever they whatever they needed. They they really helped. They were a wonderful organization, but it doesn't exist anymore. So they are negotiating with us, with the society, to turn their foundation funds over to us with the caveat that we will maintain and preserve and find a safe location for that fire truck for perpetuity. Mm -hmm. There is a second fire truck that is owned by the county or Everett or, and I don't know exactly where it is, it's not owned by us. There are rumors that they are trying to get rid of their fire truck as well. Mm -hmm. So if the city passes on maintaining its current property, which is what the fire truck is, because it's their property, it's city property, um, the other people may do the same thing. This would be a huge challenge for the Historical Society because it's going to take a lot of money, um, more money than what they have, so we can do some more fundraising. Um, and we are willing to do that because that's our mission, is to preserve the artifacts of Edmonds and South Snohomish County. That's, mm -hmm. that's our job. So you, we'll find a way. You mentioned the summer market. <clears throat> a lot of people walk down there and they think it's like put on by the city of Edmonds. And, we know. And we wish it was different. What is it that people don't know about this? I mean, how many people... I mean, it's a big undertaking, but I don't think anyone really knows how big... And it's not the city of Edmonds that runs it. No. Tell us a little bit about that, because I had no idea when you told me about the number of people and the setup for all that. I mean, you girls have probably been there, right? I've worked summer there, market. yeah. Well, we started 17 years ago in the parking lot uh, where it used to be the Safeway, mm -hmm. down there by Skippers and, and that area. We were thrilled when we were able to get 15 vendors. Um, we charged $10 a day for them to be able to come, $5 of which had to go to the city for a one-time um, vendor fee. Um, we grew from that. We wanted to immediately after we outgrew that place because he wouldn't let us expand any bigger than there. So we needed, we knew we wanted to get a little bit bigger. Uh, we tried to get it in front of the museum. We were not able to do that because they were in the process of building uh, the new police station and all that kind of stuff and you couldn't have access to it. They couldn't block off that street at that time. So we went moved to just Bell Street. Um, we very deliberately only increased five vendors and at the most, no, I think it was just five vendors a year. And sometimes, I think a couple of times we went ten because we never wanted our vendors to outnumber the customers. And if you don't have the vendors able to make money, then they're not going to come back. Our vendors are extremely important to us. We have approximately a hundred volunteers every summer to make this thing happen. Um, we have people who help with the white elephant table, which uh, people donate things to the museum or to the historical society to be sold at their, uh, and all the profits, all the, all the money from that goes straight to the museum. Um, the vendors are charged a fee, uh, a weekly fee. They don't have to go the whole year. They can go one time. They can go once a month. They can go all the time. We also enlarge to have a smaller what we call the garden market in May and June. Uh, people were wanting to have us have it uh, all year round, and we said, uh, do you understand the word divorce? And because our husbands really did, you know, <laughs> we were living and breathing. Um, the stuff from the, um, from the white elephant table used to be down in my basement. There's a pickup truck that was mine, and I decided I could no longer be you call, we haul. So in order to get out of that, I donated the truck to the museum and bought a Volkswagen. Uh, 
and and so um, the truck is used for get, transporting things to and from the market. There are people down there. Well, I used to be down there at 5:30 in the morning to set up the barricades, um, and there are other people who do that now. Thank goodness. Um, and yeah. Do you have to turn some people away? Or, oh, or what are the rules? I mean, there's a couple of things. Do you have to turn people away? And I notice there's more and more like musicians that just sort of are there. Do, do they have to get permission from yes. you? Yes. Because there's Edna's Woodway kids that have been down there playing, just playing. I so, called Jake and so pushed they have that to get a permission? long time ago. And, oh, I wanted them. Yeah. I, I courted them. Um, Jake, is it over? No. Oh. We good? Oh, okay. Jake, um, at the high school, I wanted I wanted kids at the market. I wanted it to be a family market. So I called up and I said, you've got to have a band. You've got to have a jazz band that can come down here during the time. Mm -hmm. And that worked very well for a number of years. But the guys who were most involved in it, guess what? They went away to college and mm -hmm. they didn't, you know, they, they didn't continue on. It turned out that anything much more than acoustic um, instruments is too loud for the vendors to be able oh, to sell yeah, to their customers. Mm. So electric, um, electric, Anything augmented pianos and and guitars and things like that end up being too much. Um, the the violin gals are are just wonderful. They come down. They can they can put out a. We don't charge them and they don't charge us, um, but they can put. Their, their guitar case out or their violin case out or their jar out or whatever and they can they get to keep whatever they have. Uh, as long as you stay away from the electric instruments you can have three or four different groups at a time but they all have to pass our approval before they can perform. And so performers they're scheduled. To, they have to check with you guys to in determine advance, what Saturday or two at Saturdays. At the beginning of the summer and it's all scheduled. Yeah. Whether it's the the mariachi group or the guitar player or the guy that is on the unicycle or the face mm -hmm. painter or whatever, they all come through us, and we are very careful to screen those people who come. We do not screen or jury our vendors. That is the job of the patrons. Uh -huh. If they don't sell to us, if they have uh, a certain thing. Um, well, for instance, tie-dyed t-shirts do not sell very well in Edmonds. They're great in Fremont. But if you come up here and sell them, you're not going to make much money, so you're mm -hmm. not going to come back. Mm -hmm. We don't have to say, it's my opinion that you have too many beads in your jewelry. Um, it's up to the person as to whether they are making enough money, the vendor, if they are making enough money to be able to come back and to pay the fee, which is not very much money. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really a very small amount when you stop and consider how much money they can make. And it's a wonderful thing for the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful thing for someone who doesn't want a storefront, who mm -hmm. wants to, has a hobby. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite ones is, is Gallery North, and they mm -hmm. have maybe five of their of their artists who will come down and share a booth. And so every week, because they're a conglomerate, every week they come down and you've got something new and different because you may have five different people than you did the week before. Mm -hmm. And that's that's my favorite booth in the whole mm -hmm. in the whole market. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Anyway, the money goes straight to the Historical Society. We've done our best to try to say this is this is from the Historical Society. Uh, there's our museum right down the street. Please come in and visit. We have, we've mm -hmm. got signs up saying what exhibit is on right now, um, and they still don't get it. I saw a recent exhibit. It was like about textiles and things like yes. that. Yes, yes, the Needle the, Art Guild. And the museum officially has a, a Taryn Erickson is the official uh, she's, she's trained the director of the museum and how much mm -hmm. training i mean this i mean this is a position that's a paid position yes and for for example for high school students who may not know this there's more than just oh i'm in charge of museum i mean what are some of the qualifications that she must have to have well there is a degree in museology that you can get we have another lady who is there who is an intern yeah. uh, and she's been with us for about three years now and several other interns have done their work on their masters 
uh, in museum science or whatever, you know, with us. And they will, uh, before we put the train in downstairs, we had a wonderful uh, marine room, which has now moved into one of the storage rooms. Well, that originally, when it was put up, was, was put up by a, a young lady who was getting her master's degree. And she, her master's degree was based on that exhibit hmm. and the research that she did for it. And hmm. the whole theme and the thesis and everything else was, was involved in the maritime history of, of the area. Think, think about oral history. And I'm, you think of each have get a question for this one. So oral history, I mean, I happened to show up with you guys and, and, and you were really interested in collecting oh, oral history. And I think for a second, in an ideal world, um, I have to think way into the future, um, how, what, give me your pie in the sky version of how oral history could be collected by the museum. What are things that you've thought about a lot? Because that's one of the museum goals is to collect oral history. How, how, how do you see that over, over time? What would that look like? First of all, I say bless you, Jeff Bennett, mm -hmm. um, because this has been my passion. We are losing people monthly, probably weekly, that have so much to give in the way of oral history of the area. Uh, there have been some books written. There have been some other oral histories that have been done. There's a wonderful oral history of the founders of the of the Historical Society uh, while they're sitting there talking. It's it's in the archives, um, and they're they're talking about the Indians who would come and take the pies off their shelves that were sitting in their windowsills. In, in Edmonds? Walking, yes, walking in Edmonds. You know, they'd be walking through, and, and it was not a village. It was not a, a Native American village, but the they would walk through, going from one place to another, and if they saw an apple pie in somebody's window, they just took it. And it was just, you know, <laughs> oh, there's lots of that. fun, fun, fun history of this, and this was done in 1974 or 5, I believe. We, My husband put it on CDs. Uh, so it's down there on that. We took it off of the old tape. Yeah. Probably um, a lot of this history is invaluable, irreplaceable. Um, when it's gone, it's gone. We do not have currently in our culture an oral history tradition. Almost yeah. every culture in the world has an oral, tradition, oral history tradition except Americans today. Mm -hmm. And that breaks my heart. It absolutely so, breaks so my heart. So would you see it like this, sort of, with a video, and then I'll make, yes. maybe transcribe to into print form, so like historians could then, yep, there's a video, but then would also look at the printed version of it as well? Probably. The printed version is more important. Yeah. And the reason the printed version is more important is because technology is running faster than all of our material will yeah. be able to stay up with it. Um, just as my husband had to take that... Uh, cassette tape mm -hmm. and transfer it to a different media. Mm -hmm. There's going to come a time when the CDs are extinct. Mm -hmm. We have 78 records that nothing can be played on. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we have um, we have 45 records that I'm not even sure that can be played on. But mm -hmm. we have a few of the of the items in our archives that can play these things. I have a, a wax, um, a wax cylinder thing that plays music from a very long time ago. But how many times are you going to find those? Yeah. So um, you, I, I am much more concerned about having it on paper because the paper will be here as long as we put it mm -hmm. archivally in a safe place. Mm -hmm. We use acid-free paper to. Um, uh, to separate the pages as needed, uh, we can we can even write it on acid-free paper, um, and we have done so in the past. Where then it is it is kept for a much longer time. Mm -hmm. But you don't. How many times have you talked to your grandparents and found out what games they played as a child? Yeah. yeah. And how many times have you talked to your grandparents to see how was their classroom organized? You know, mm -hmm. these, these are things that, that we don't do anymore. We don't have, because we have many forms of entertainment, we don't have the family communication as a form of entertainment. The stories that Papa would say. Mm -hmm. um, the, my husband is so full of 
Don't true say and untrue <laughs> jargon that that have been that they have been the delight of the children, but they're not telling their children because their children are texting. And I'm not saying that we should object to texting, and I'm not saying that we should not use those forms, but let's let's be all inclusive. Mm -hmm. And I'm so proud of you, young ladies, for uh, being involved in history, and I hope you will share that. My father did it, and I threw up, but I still got the message, you know. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. We're getting it. We're, uh, it, it's just so important because mm -hmm. it's going away. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to go away. <laughs> now, girls, you've been listening to Mary talk about the museum, talk about some of the things the museum does. Are there some things you've been thinking a little bit about you know, how she came to do this and have this passion. Anything particular that you think about? Well, I'm curious about, you told us earlier you were from Oklahoma. Yes. And about, with your childhood, in your history classes, did did you enjoy history, learning it, like, in that form as well as now you, as you do with the society? No, <laughs> I didn't. Uh, except for one, one teacher. Um, I'm not... It's a lot like what I was saying about the people in my background. I am not as interested in the names and dates and places and the dry part of it as I am the story. I think sometimes we forget story is is the bigger part of the word history. Mm -hmm. um, and I had one teacher who was absolutely fantastic. He was He was a retired serviceman, and when he told the stories of World War One and World War Two and stuff like that. He told the story. And he made us learn the, well, at least we had to memorize, the sequences, because what led up to it leads, you know, is important because this causes this cause and effect, you know. Mm -hmm. So you so you're learning cause and effect when you learn the sequences. But he really didn't care if we got the year right. And I don't know if that's considered a, a good thing or a bad thing in, in the in the annals of, of education today, but um, it, it it made an impression on me. Yeah. The cause and effect thing is 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 really very important to to history. Mm -hmm. Another question? Or? Yes, I did grow up in Oklahoma, and I loved mm -hmm. it. I'm an Okie, and I'm real proud of it. <laughs> it, it cuckooed when you said that. Yes. <laughs> good job. Good job. Do you have a question? Um, let's see. Cause I do if you want to look for one. You, yeah. I have a question for you. Um, uh, in, in the year 2011, there seemed to be a lot more opportunities for women. And in the 70s, I mean, you were already showing leadership way back in the 70s. Was it always easy for you? As a, I mean, were there as many opportunities... Are there more opportunities that you see now for, for women, for example? I mean, I'm, I'm asking kind of an odd question, but you were doing work with the museum question. back in the 70s. Oh, was it really easy? Was it really easy? I was, I was involved in museums in the 50s. Oh, you were? Uh-huh. And I really was. Is it? I, I what was so different maybe about that time era for you personally? I mean, For me personally, and especially in Oklahoma, because if you are... Oklahoma's not the South, but it's South Midwest, and... My my heritage comes from Mississippi and Virginia and and that sort of thing. So they're very very strict about what um, women can do and what they can't do. And and um, um, it was very hard for me because I'm a stubborn Okie and I and because maybe I have way too many people in my background that fought in the Revolutionary War or something. Um, I'm a direct person. I am a person who bores easily. I am jumping outside of my box all the time. I cannot stay in a box. Don't try to do it to me. Um, I was a little bit of the black sheep of the family. We figured that out so far. <laughs> yes. And, and sometimes I still am considered that. I mean, because tradition and, and placement in a family in a family setting, doesn't go away easily. Um, what makes you What makes you feel like you were kind of a, you kind of a rebel? Oh, a absolutely! Bit? I did not follow anybody's instructions. <laughs> I, I was just, you know, if if I had a direction to go, I went, and and uh, 
you know, I jumped off Carol Bodie's roof with my umbrella because I wanted to be a paratrooper, and I <laughs> and it was two stories high, and I, you know, I I have pictures of me when I'm two years old crawling across the whole top of the, of the swing set bar up there and it's eight feet up in the air and I can't really walk very well and I'm climbing and doing and and I was just sort of a wild child. And, were, yeah. were you involved in sports and things like that growing up? Oh yes. What, I was I mean, a what were your swimmer, sports? I was a runner, I was, I don't know, I was all of it. Broad jumper, uh, a lot of track type things and soccer and um, archery and riflery and <laughs> oh. anything that I could do. Uh, I was a cheerleader. I was 